me and me and Mike Missinelli kind of went at it a little bit. He was like, I think you came out of the womb, you know, <laughs> talk, you know, the first word, the first word you ever said was blitz. You could stop somebody because you get three and outs in the passing game. In the run game, my hands are tied because you're beating me up. It's no moss. Speaking of a guy who played on one of them defenses, he knows what I'm talking about too. <laughs> Seth Joyner, Seth, man, you guys are killing it on that post-game show. I so love it. Thanks so much for finding time. I know you're swamped, man. Thank you so much. What's going on, Big Sil? Hey, man, am I right when I say that, that one of the reasons that this football team is starting to show some signs of life on that defensive side, it, I think it's because the secondary, Seth, I think the secondary's played so well, especially at the cornerback position. That's why you're starting to see pressure getting to the quarterback over the last two weeks. Is that fair? Well, I think it's a combination of things. I think, you know, not only, you know, is the secondary playing well, but, you know, I'm seeing some things out of the defensive front that I hadn't seen in a while. You know, you're, you're seeing some some line stunts. Um, you're seeing some creative blitzing where you're getting some guys that are running free. Um, and, and the question I have to ask, Dan, is where was this last year? And most people will say, oh, you know, they didn't have the cornerbacks and whatnot. But the one thing that pressure creates, you know, and I've been catching a lot of flat social media and everything, you know, because in post game last week, me and me and Mike Missinelli kind of went at it a little bit. He was like, I think you came out of the womb, you know, <laughs> Talk, you know, the first word, the first word you ever said was blitz. Well, I, I'm talking about blitz from the standpoint of creating pressure. Um, you know, there's a couple of different ways that you create pressure on offenses. You know, back in our day, we created pressure through intimidation. Um, you hit a quarterback enough. You hit wide receivers running across the middle enough. Um you beat up on running backs, you know, enough, you know, you can intimidate them into raving, waving the, 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 the white flag, if you will. Today's NFL doesn't work that way because you can't intimidate from a defensive standpoint anymore. So you have to find arterial, uh, arterial motives or arterial ways, you know, to create pressure. Now, Pressure, pressure is the is the great equalizer, you know, in football, especially when you're talking about the pressure that you can apply to the most important guy on the offensive side of the ball, and that's the quarterback. You know, when you look at some guys are not wired to handle pressure. When you look at what the Eagles did, the, the last four quarterbacks the Eagles played against, they played against Jared Goff, they played against Kirk Cousins, they played against um, Carson, Carson Wentz. And and then you end up, you know, Trevor Lawrence playing last week against a young Trevor Lawrence. OK, I'll give him a pass on on pressure, but he's young. But I don't care what quarterback you're talking about. When you get to a point where you are, um, you know, you create pressure, it speeds up the quarterback's clock. It speeds up his his process of how he gets through his progression. It speeds up his decision making and it forces um, mistakes. So if you look at Jared Goff in the first half of that game, he looked like he was just about ready to give up. But then they, but but then they got conservative and they 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 stopped putting pressure on him. They couldn't get there with four anymore, and he started to get his footing back and he started to get comfortable in the pocket again. And the next thing you know, they're clinging to a a, th a three point lead. And they got to hold on just to win a game that should have been over in the third quarter. That's just that's my assessment. So when you're talking about these four quarterbacks, if you could have came with enough pressure to force the issue like you did with nine sacks against um, uh, um, Carson Wentz. I mean, they just battered him into bad mistake after bad mistake. Um, and that's what pressure does. So if you want to play conservative, then you're going to be in a shootout every single week, in my opinion. But if you have enough gumption about you, you know, to and creativity about you as a defensive coordinator to create some pressures, 
that forces a quarterback because he's got a free runner coming at him to make one decision and one decision only. And if it's a wrong one, it's an incomplete pass. You're off the field. If it's a wrong one, it's a, a an interception. If it's a wrong one, he's held on to the ball too long. The pressure gets there. You get a sack, sack force fumble. Um, that's just a fact of, you know, what the game is like now and what the game means. You know, if you want to play passive, quarterbacks will cut you and shred you to pieces. Pressure means everything in today's game, even much more so than in our day, Dan. You know what? And Seth, I correct me completely if I'm wrong here. I don't think you guys, because Coach Jimmy Johnson always had a philosophy. He goes, I don't have to blitz. If my four dudes can get can get home. I don't need that because, I mean, when you got Jerome and you got Reggie and that linebacking core you had and those guys, those freak shows running around back there, Wes and them dudes and Andre, I mean, you, do you really have to be creative or do you just bring, like you said, the pressure? And I get today's game. You can't play that style of ball any longer. So it's more containment, keeping everything underneath. But to me, that's more of a product today then, Seth, of the players stepping up and not so much Jonathan Gannon's system. I mean, Gannon is still, to me, in my opinion, he's being a little bit more creative because he's got a couple more pieces he can move around. But I see player production lifting up, not him being creative. Is that fair? Well, let me let, let me go back to your comment before that first. Um if you got four Hellraisers, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you can you can afford to rush four. Um, but a smart offensive coordinator knows that he's got you out, man, by one. You're sending four. He's got five. All it takes is for you to keep a tight end in, for you to keep a back end. And you can sit back there in that zone all you want to. But if they go max protection and they keep a back and a tight end in, now you got seven guys to block four, okay? And you're not going to get there. The other thing is, you know, it's football is a risk game. Every single time the quarterback drops back to throw the ball, there's a risk that he can make a completion. And that's the probability that you're hoping for from an offensive perspective. But there's also a risk that he could throw an interception. There's a risk that, you know, he could be sacked and you cause a fumble. But that's not stopping the NFL, you know, from skewing the numbers from a run dominant league to a pass dominant league where you see guys throwing the ball 40, 50 times a game. So don't talk to me about risk. And I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about those who who, you know, claim the symbols of, oh, it's a different league and you can't bring the pressure. And, you know, it's a risk to blitz. No, it's not, because every single play is a risk. So. I don't even think about football in the terms uh, in terms of it being risk. You know, when you come on a blitz, you're saying that I'm bringing something that you can't pick up, okay? And if you can't pick it up, then I'm going to create chaos for your quarterback and for your offensive line, okay? So I, I, I just don't believe in that old adage that, you know, you bend but don't break because sooner or later you're going to snap. And that's what happens with most of these offenses that play that way. You give up, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit. Next thing you know, they're in the red zone. They're in scoring position. Now you got to come with a blitz, okay? And now you really go, you know, um, max protection because you got a wide receiver out there, a number one that's better than your number one corner, and he's going to win that matchup eight out of ten times. So why put yourself in that situation? Now, to go back to, to Gannon, yeah, the players are playing better, but the scheme is better, okay? Tell me the last time. I've been watching Jonathan Gannon in this offense for, you know, all the last year and through four games this year, okay? I can't remember seeing them run off defensive line stunts, ETs, you know, um, TEs. Uh, double double wrap where you just angle both down and wrap a tackle all you didn't see that before you know they're doing these stunts and then they're sending tj edwards behind it so they're screwing up the blocking scheme and then they're sending the extra rusher you know and there's no one there to pick him up so that's why they're having success and then i'll submit to you this okay no one's talked about it no one wants to talk about it um, everyone wants to continue to give, you know, Gannon the accolades. He's the defensive coordinator. 
he should get the accolades, okay? But let me let me submit this to you. You know Vic Fangio is a consultant for the Eagles. Oh, Deep. absolutely. I see his okay. pan prints all over this. Okay, okay. So now. Especially these, in the stunts and in the T-stunts, I see it. But that's my point. Are these uh, Is the improvement that you're seeing an improvement in Jonathan Gannon's philosophy? Or was Vic Fangio brought in here to give him some things? It's a collaboration. That he didn't, that, that, that he didn't necessarily have in his utility belt, Okay. So now he looks like a genius, and maybe Vic Fangio is the one that's crafting some of these blitzes and crafting because I've never seen them run a blitz where they had a runner, a free runner at the quarterback. You know, Seth, you bring a point up now, and I'm going to go over here, and that's funny you should say that because Von Miller in Denver, when Fangio was in Denver, they had those creative outside rushes, and I, I, I swear to you, in that Jags game, and especially in the Washington game. I saw some of the same stuff that they did with Von Miller in Denver that they're doing on the perimeter now with Hassan Reddick. And that wasn't there last year. There's no way that those T-stunts on the end like that and then bringing that pressure and then, like you said, coming from behind with T.J. Edwards in there, that wasn't anywhere to be seen. And you saw a ton of that when he was, when he was in Denver. Well, listen, I mean, you, I, I it's give, okay too, I guess. You know, he's a consultant. That's all good. Exactly. But listen, I give I give the Eagles brass a lot of, um, you know, a lot of credit for going and bringing him in and hiring him, you know, as a consultant. Because for all the hoopla that we got about Jonathan Gannon last year, I just didn't see it. I was saying all year long, Dan, I said, where's the creativity? Okay. I see Jonathan Gannon standing on the sideline. He's got a play sheet that looks like this, okay? So tell me how much creativity, <laughs> and, and I can see the back of it. There's nothing on it. So he's only looking at this part of it. So how much creativity are you actually seeing? I mean, how, how much can you have on a half of an 8 by 10 I think those are all base defenses he has on that list, and they're going off it. There's nothing wrong with having base defenses, but you got to have your blitzes listed somewhere. I mean, you see offensive coordinators, and they got a sheet in front of them like this, front and back, with, a, with another flip to it. So they've they got all of these formations and all of these things that they do, you and know, they and, and you're and you're this simple, and you think you're going to compete, you know. I mean, my, my whole thing is there are ways to be creative. Um, and create pressure. And, and and don't get me wrong. I say this all the time. When people hear me talk about blitzing, they hear me talking about pressure, all they talk about, oh, Seth is living in the past. He's living in the old style of defense. They don't run defenses that way anymore. To a certain extent, you know what, you're right. But back in the day, we dictated to, to offenses what they could run. We dictated to offenses the personnel that they put on the field. It's the exact opposite now because teams will go three wide receivers, four wide receivers. Why? Because they want you to put a certain personnel on the they field. They want you and nickel. They've, they've identified, okay, they've identified the mismatch on the outside and the fact that you go dime, okay, makes you less strong against the run if you've got a halfway decent offensive line and you spread out and you go four wides and you got a really good running back in the back, in the backfield, okay, guess what? You got man on blocking, okay, with the four downs and a and a linebacker, and you got a safety in the box, okay, who really don't want much any parts of you know that that run game. And if you mess around and throw the tight end back in the in the in the equation. You can run away from the tight end and man up across the board and leave that defensive end unblocked. And now you got man on blocking across the board. So, I mean, there's this strategy and this chess game that goes on within the game of football. And defenses, in my opinion, need to learn how to and figure out to because there's a way, you know, to, to reverse this, this trend of, Offense is totally dictating to you what kind of defense you're going to run and what kind of personnel you're going to put on the field. You can change that with pressure because you, when you start putting offenses in a position 
where protection becomes an issue, now all of a sudden you've got to make an adjustment. Okay, you got to take one of those wide outs out of the game. You got to put, you got to attach the tight end and keep him in and have him block. You got to make your running back check release. He can't just release hot anymore. You know, so for, for me, you know, that's viable. You know, yeah. and if I can see it, and I just get paid to be an analyst every Sunday, tell me why these guys that live it every single day of their lives, you know, three sixty five. You know, it's not just during the season. They're using the entire offseason to self-evaluate and look at the games that they play and look at the teams that are going to be a problem for them, you know, within their within their division and within their conference. They're breaking all that stuff down. You mean to tell me, what are you guys doing all offseason if you're not coming up with more creative ways to create pressure and create problems for offenses? Because you can't just can't play cover, you know, quarter, quarters, halves, you know, quarters, you know, quarters across the board, cover two, cover three. These quarterbacks are too smart for that. These offensive coordinators are too smart for that. Seth, let me go here with you. Um, how would you defend Kyler Murray this weekend? And before you answer that, you know, I, I said this to everybody, and tell me if you subscribe to – you know, the, the difference in kind of what you see when you're preparing for a team like Tom Brady, Joe Burrow – Justin Herbert, those guys are seven-step guys. They're not going to break down or threaten the edges when mm -hmm. the, you're playing teams like that. But when you see Kyler Murray in practice every day, say you're J.J. Watt or you're anybody on that, you see Jalen Hurts every day. So when Jalen Hurts steps on the field on Sunday, they see this in practice. They see that mm -hmm. style. It's 2.0. It's almost like a mirror that you're going against. So they're not going to be surprised – on how Jalen is going to attack the defense because they see it with Kyler Murray. So I say this, they're not, I think some of these teams have been surprised the way that third and eight, he breaks the edges down, Seth. He gets out of the perimeter and he's finding AJ, who's a mismatch in almost every week he plays. I think they catch some of these teams going, wow, this guy's really improved. But now you got a guy who kind of resembles uh, Jalen Hurts a little bit in the guy you see. Do you, do you see my philosophy a little bit in that? I don't think the Cardinals are going to be surprised when they play Jalen. Listen, I don't think they're going to be surprised. I think anyone who, you know, breaks down Kyler Murray and studies film that are surprised, they're an idiot. You know, that that's just my opinion. Listen, the first two weeks of the season, they, they, they really, really struggled. You know, and then the Rams – kind of have their number. They've lost like 11 in a row over the last three. It was close, 20 to 12 or something. like. It was close, yeah, too. They, 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 for some reason, though, that they can't beat the Rams specifically. They can't beat the Rams at home. Um, but Kyler tried to stay in the pocket, you know, the first couple of games. Once he started running around a little bit, I think he had like 12 runs last week. Once he started to run around a little bit, all of a sudden, you know, the offense, the complexity of the offense changed because, you know, even in that game against the Raiders where they came back, you know, he started scrambling in the second half down the stretch. That's what really won them that game. They, they were completely outset in the first half of that game. Absolutely. Changed the whole thing in the second half. And you're right. They rallied back. So for you to go on, for, for the Eagles to go into this game, anybody to go in this game and be surprised, you know, listen, he doesn't have – his security blanket. DeAndre Hopkins is, is his guy, okay? You got, you know, A.J. Green, and A.J. is, like, on the back nine of his career, but he can still make some plays. He's Hollywood good, Brown's played he, well he's, for them. He, he's, he's a good possession receiver, and you've got Hollywood Brown, you know, just sub-4-3 speed. Um, until he gets DeAndre Hopkins back, I think this offense is going to struggle yep. because – DeAndre is the difference maker. He's the difference maker from the standpoint of, um, you know, that's his security blanket. He dictates coverage, which gives Kyla an early read in the, in the in pre snap as to, you know, what the coverage is. You know, if you're going to roll his way and double him, that means that somebody else is going to be open. Um, but I expect for him to continue to move around and continue to run. Now, how in the world? are the Eagles going to, you know, contain him? Uh, you know, do you, are you comfortable in a little more five-man pressure, a five-man line, uh, which allows you to get, um, you know, five guys into the pass rush? 
Um, are you more comfortable, um, you know, blitzing him? Um, the one thing that, that, that worries me about, you know, the Eagles is they are so darn, um, they're so darn undisciplined in their pass rush lanes. Um, they're just healthy skelter, willy nilly defensive linemen, you know, the defensive same end guys in the same rush line. Yeah. They, they, they just don't, you know, yeah. when they rush sometimes and even on those plays away, you know, yeah. when you get plays away, the defensive linemen crash down the line. Of Come scrimmage. underneath. And then, and then you've got, then you've got, you know, the bootlegs where, where quarterbacks, I mean, not non-running quarterbacks are getting outside. And I, and my thing is, you allow Kyler Murray to get outside and you're in man coverage, you're in trouble. He going okay? 50. I mean, he 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 can really hurt you. So my thing is, you ask, hmm. okay, how do they, how do they get him contained? Okay, you can still do the same things that you're doing, but anybody who winds up as the as the contained guy has to be extremely disciplined in what they do, okay? You coming from the outside, if you get a sack, it has to be on the outside shoulder of the tackle, okay? It has to be. You cannot take an inside charge. You cannot run up the field past him, okay? Um, you just can't do that. You have to be disciplined in what you do. Seth, do you, you want, think they have you enough? Want you, you want him to operate from the pocket, okay? Because he's less accurate and he's less dangerous from the pocket than he is once he starts to move around. So you want to keep him there, make him have to see over those offensive linemen, which he struggles with. He gets a lot of balls batted down. That's what you want to have happen. And anything else that they decide to do, you know, you're, you're asking for trouble. How about this, Seth? Are you bring, Man, so many spectacular points there. I mean, the communication on the team, because you said something to me the last time you were on. If Jerome was going to say something and he was going to try to do something, he would turn to you and go, take an inside rush here. And you would cheat over to make sure you got the three, the three technique or the three gap or the C gap, and you would slide over to get his ass and his backside on that because you knew if he went underneath, there could be a gaping hole down in there. So you're protecting his flank. And when you're talking about defending a guy like Murray, you got a defensive end crashing down. If they're not communicating with one another, that guy's going to go 50 yards on you up the sidelines, man. I mean, he's a true threat. You think that's one of also the reasons that this team is starting to pick it up a little bit defensively because there's better communication? Well, yeah. I mean, they're they're in the second year of, you know, of running this defense. Well, these are new dudes, though. There's like five guys on that defense that haven't played together. True, but the guys that have been there, you know, the key to really good defense is communication. You know, I mean, I don't care whether you're rushing the passer or whether you're in coverage behind it. You know, where I see teams not communicating, the Eagles kind of got into a little bit a little bit of that last week when, when Darius Slay went out and then when, with Avante Maddox out. When you have guys that are used to being in there together, they're chatting and they're talking all the time. They're talking pre-snap. Hey, watch this, watch that. You know, if he gives me the release here, this is what I'm going to do. So now you're kind of anticipating things that are happening. When you get those young guys in there who haven't played, they're, they're like mutes. They're out there playing and they don't say anything. And then once the ball is snapped, now you're trying to talk. Hey, it's too late. If you're not alerting those things beforehand, now you, 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 you're going to have problems. But the good thing is, you know, they're, they're in this defense for the second year running, <clears throat> the guys who really know what are communicating, and that will force the young guys to begin to open up their mouth and communicate. Now, I can remember standing at the linebacker position and the, you know, the formation changed because of a shift or a motion, you know, and I turned and looked at the free safety. I'm like, man, open your mouth. I know what the check is, but everybody else don't know what the check is. Open your mouth so we can figure out so we're all on the same page. Because I know that the defense changed, but you haven't said a word. Or Byron might change it up front where, you know, the front and the linebackers can hear it, but the guys behind don't hear it. Okay. So, I mean, communication is key. And, and you know, you got – I'm looking at your comments here. There's, there's this one guy on here, um, Gee Jr. He says, quarterbacks haven't been running on the Eagles. Not sure what Seth is referring to. Well, they haven't been running because they – they we're not talking about 
we haven't had we haven't played against a running quarterback. Where's Kirk Cousins running to? Where's Jared Goff running to? Where's Carson Wentz running to? Okay, where are these guys running to? They're not running anywhere. But you full well know that um, Kyler Murray can and will run if you don't keep him contained. Okay, so that's what I'm referring to, Gee Junior. Let me throw this at you here. Finally, here, Seth. Seth, I want you to step me straight here because you've been involved in Philly sports and in media for the last 35 years. So I said something about, and I heard Donovan McNabb on WIP the other day, and he said a comment that went like this. Well, this team's two, three years away from a Super Bowl. And I went like this. That's actually shade at Jalen Hurts because Joe Burrow didn't need three years to take the shitty Cincinnati Bengals to the Super Bowl. Um, Patrick Mahomes needed one year. Brady needed one year. Those guys weren't all playing together. Look at what Brady did in Tampa. One year. Look at what Stafford did. One year. That league is different when he played than it is today because of the salary cap. And then T.O. came on my Twitter page. And I said, T.O., you're right. That shit's petty. Here's a guy that took a dump on Deshaun Jackson for being a pro bowler at two different positions. He took a dump um on you and again Terrell Owens is not the most likable guy on the planet I get it however the reason that I think McNabb is who he is is because he's one of the pettiest human beings I've ever seen in my life am I wrong when I say that and I thought it was a shot at Jalen going he needs two more three more years I think that team could win the NFC this year if they have everything lay right and I think they get to the Super Bowl and play one of those good teams like the Bills it's a different NFL Seth and he just looks at it that way. And so McNabb and T.O. are on my Twitter page going back and forth on it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. I'm on Owen's side with this. You're a petty dude. And instead of rooting for fans, rooting for your teammates, you should always be pushing your teammates. Thank you, man. I had Jim Kelly, Seth, on two days ago. You know what he was saying? I hope Josh Allen does something that I wasn't able to do. And I hope he brings one of those Lombardi trophy homes. Man, I just hope he doesn't run too much. I am so pulling for him. That's not how that dude is. Am I wrong? Listen, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disparage Donovan. You know, Donovan has said some things that have made some fans in Philadelphia really dislike him since he left. Um I'm opinionated and I don't give a two hoots, you know, what anybody thinks about my opinions. They're my opinions based upon my experience and my knowledge in the game of professional football. And I think that I know enough about the game to be extremely convicted in my opinions, you know, and everyone is encouraged and, you know, it's their right to have their opinion about what they believe, okay? And you can have an opinion that differs from mine. The only thing that I ever ask on social media when I'm dealing with people that are like that is to just be be respectful because I'll never disrespect you, okay? We'll always, you and I will always get to a point in our disagreement where I look at you and say, okay, let's agree to disagree and move on. But some people on social media wanna make it personal, you know? And sometimes, you know, uh, my better half, she's like, why are you, why are you arguing with the idiots on social Dude, media? My she, she looks at me every day, Seth, stop. And she'll look at, she'll look at me and say, you know, if you, if you argue, if you argue with the idiot, who's the idiot, but that's not the point. The point is, is that you got to always be respectful. Okay. And the one thing that I don't take is I don't take disrespect. I just will not stand for disrespect, especially if I post something and you're responding to it, you know, just go up on the top right corner, push that little arrow and block me if you don't want to hear what the hell I have to say. But I'm not going to let you come on my page, on my thread and disrespect me. And you don't know whether to put a jock strap over your ass or over your balls. OK, that's just that's just fact. OK, now back to Donovan. Donovan has his opinion. And he's entitled to his opinions. And you and I and T.O. and everybody else can say, hey, you know what, Donovan? We think you're wrong. And I'm not even going to point the finger at him and say, you're jealous, you're petty, or any of that. He's entitled to his opinion, okay? Everybody's, listen, 
Most of the fans in Philadelphia were not on the Jalen Hurts wagon, okay? He's got the team at 4-0, and and I see some people in your threads right now that have said, oh, Jalen Hurts is going to get a Kyler Murray-like contract, okay? Where did that I, come I, I, don't, I'm, I don't see that yet, just beating Kirk Cousins. Listen, I think just, he, he's got a long way to go. That's I'm just saying, that's their opinion, okay? So when people – shift opinions and shift their stances over a four game stint. Okay. And I've been saying all along, you and I had these discussions, you know, in the off season, I said, I don't ever talk about what someone else can't do. Okay. Because I've been in that position before as an eighth round draft pick where nothing was expected of me. Okay. And a first, a second, rather a third, a fifth. Okay linebacker drafted ahead of me two years later they were all gone and i was the last man standing so i don't talk about what other people can or can't do prove to me and i and and i and i've always said jalen hurts prove that you can be the guy okay and i'm not gonna pass judgment on him until i see whether he can do it or not because at the end of the day who am i i don't know what's in his head i don't know how intelligent of a football player he is i don't know what's in his heart I don't know what his worth ec- work ethic is like. I don't know him. So it's it's wrong for me to sit here and talk about what he can or what he cannot be or what this team can or cannot be because I'm not at practice every day. I'm not hanging out with all the guys on the defense every day, okay? I could tell you that my defense, my guys, we was going to kick some ass every Sunday. You want to know why? Because I knew those guys. And I knew how we were, and I knew what we were going to bring to the table. I couldn't speak for the offensive side of the ball, but for, for but, but my 10 guys that I laced it up with every Sunday, you know, we're going to kick some ass or we're going to lose trying to, all right? So now when you talk about this team and what they can do, listen, they're the only undefeated team left in the National Football League right Seth, now. Seth, that don't make that's, them the best team in the league, though. I'm not, I never said that because we had the conversation last week, you know, in post game, you know, where did, it, where did the Eagles rank? And Seth Joyner's, um, um, what the hell do they call it? Where they rank them? Power rankings. Okay. And my power rankings is Kansas City, it's the Buffalo Bills, and it's the Philadelphia Eagles. Correct. Okay? That's now, where I have it. To me, right now, they're playing the best out of all the teams in the NFC. That's just a fact. Agreed. Okay. That is just a fact. Now, does that mean that they're going to win a Super Bowl? Listen, if Kansas City stays healthy and they play the way that they played against Tampa Bay the other night, they ain't nobody beating them in the Super Bowl, okay? Nobody. It's going to take, you know, an injury to Mahomes or, you know, some injuries. Chris on the Jones, somebody on that defense. Chris side. Jones, exactly. It's going to take, you know, things like that. Injuries are going to be what's going to change the narrative for them. OK, but you think about the Eagles, the Eagles, what's the what's the two teams, you know, that can really cause problems for the Eagles? You know, I think the, the 49ers, I think the 49ers can cause them some issues because they're built alike. They look a lot alike, Seth. I mean, you want to know why you, you want to know why I disagree with that, Dan? Please, because I because I put Jimmy Garoppolo in that same category of quarterbacks that went under duress, went under pressure. He will fold like a Samsonite. Why do you think they were trying to get rid of him? They were trying to get rid of him this, for the same exact reason that Sean McVay got rid of Jared Goff. Because when it comes to crunch time, he cannot stand against the pressure. Shit, I okay? thought it was more of an injury. They were he's thirty eight and nine, he's thirty eight and seventeen, and Kyle Shanahan is nine and twenty nine without him. That just that goes to show you. Well, well, listen. Is he a big part of what they do? You got to look at the 9 and 28 and ask yourself. The reason why they lost the Super Bowl to Kansas City. Yep. Okay. Go back and watch the game. Second half, he was terrible. The divisional game and the, and the NFC Championship game, they ran the ball 2-1. to one, Okay. They ran rough shot through the, through the entire NFC in the playoffs. They get to the Super Bowl and all of a sudden – Shanahan wants to make him the MVP, and you're going to put the ball in his hand. All they had to do was run the ball because Kansas City's defense was straight-up hot garbage, trash. 
Couldn't okay? stop the run. If they would have just ran the football, yeah. they would have won. But because they had to put the ball in his hands, and because Kansas City with Steve Spagnolo knew that he couldn't stand the pressure, he started to come. And when he started to come, he wilted like steam spinach. That's <laughs> Hey, so That's Seth, I'd be interested. Who are the two teams you think could give Philly problems? I think that, you know, if the young wide receivers in Green Bay find their footing, and we're going to get an idea when they play them down the road, if they can figure out, okay, what it is that, you know, to get on the same page with, with Aaron, the defense is playing a little bit better. If they can find some continuity by the time they get to playoff time, they could be a problem. Um, the Rams. The same way, you know, if they can figure out, if they can figure it out. They Their old line's really got troubles. I, I get it. But if they can figure it out in some way, some fashion, you know, they're going to be right there, you know, because they're they're talented enough and good enough on the defense, you know, to really gain possessions, you know, for the offensive side of the ball. Now, I'm not saying one way or the other that these guys, you know, that those teams, you know, will just – beat down the Eagles. But I'm saying, in my opinion, those are the two teams, in my opinion, when it's all said and done, with all things being equal, that you know what they are gonna they're gonna give the Eagles the greatest problem because you don't I don't think the see, Bucks are in that conversation then. I don't see the Bucks, you know, recovering. I, I really don't. You know, they, they can't run the ball because they're 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 um their offensive line got three guys know, out. They, they they can't get it done. And if you go back and you look at Kansas City, Kansas City has now formulated a game plan for how to attack that defense. For the first time, you know, as, as long as, you know, I've been watching Todd Bowles, he had no answer whatsoever. No answer, you know. So teams are going to go and they're going to get that game film and they're going to break that blueprint down and they're going to figure out ways to emulate what – um you know, what Kansas City was able to do. Now, granted, you know, you got a quarterback that's just different. You know, you got a tight end that's, you know, tied to that quarterback that doesn't run traditional routes. He just seems like he's out there schoolyarding it, you know, half the time. And Mahomes knows where he is and what he's going to do. Then you got, you know, a, a, a core of wide receivers that, you know, that pretty much just, you know, they're like no names but they're all straight up ballers. And then when you look at the run game, my goodness, that kid number 10, I forget his name, that they drafted in the, in the seventh round. I mean, he, he, he's a beast. Now, you got to be able to duplicate or replicate some of that stuff. But at the same time, there's a blueprint, you know, and the Eagles should be smart enough, you know, to utilize that blueprint after – you know, the garbage that they put on the field against Tampa Bay twice last year. Let me let me finish with this one here with the Cowboys and next week and Jordan Mulata and some of the injuries, especially with – now, if you play Mulata this week, there, it, it may be a game-time decision. They may just be holding uh, their cards close to their vest here. But to me, Seth, I don't really need him Sunday. I'd rather have him – healthier against Michael Parsons next Sunday night. It's a divisional game. It's the game of the year. I know we can't look. Look, I want to win this game Sunday because it's an NFC game too, because this could do seating in the conference too at the end of the year. So I get it all. No game is you should not be trying to win. I get that. But to me, the importance of Milata is huge you're going to have not J.J. Watt 10 years ago, but you got a different J.J. Watt, but a 60% Malata. He'll make him look like old J.J. Watt. Now, if I rest him, I'm going to have him healthier, at least, against Michael Parsons, who people are considering in the same category as Aaron Donald. What would you do if you're the Eagles this week with Jordan Malata? Well, I mean, with Malata, you got to ask yourself, you got to ask yourself, what – what's the chances with that injury that you could make it worse? You know, um, because I saw him on the sideline during last week's game, you know, hitting the pad. Yeah. I saw him know, punching to, too. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to, trying to give it a go. Um, I don't know, you know, what the diagnosis of that was, where they, well, were they just, kept him out all week. Well, okay. So are you being, are you being, 
conservative with him or is there really an issue? Um, if there's really an issue, he's too valuable down the road for you to put him out, you know, against a team who really doesn't have a premier pass rusher. You know, Mark Marcus Golden on the outside is the best that they have. Part, Chandler Chandler Jones is gone. They don't have a guy that's really going to scare you. How about the that people, Allen kid? Huh? How about that Allen kid they got from uh, Boston College? He's not that bad. Well, I mean, he's not that bad. I mean, they, they've got – they're going to create the majority of their havoc, you know. Linebackers. On, on the, you know, on the inside with the two big guys, you know, yeah. and if they decide to blitz the linebacker. Um, if say a if his, you know, if, if his ankles still bothering him, you know, then you, you know, these guys, you got to sit because the long-term prognosis is what's more important than winning this game against, against the Cardinals. Um, you got to have those guys healthy for Dallas and beyond. And if there's any way that playing those guys this week exacerbates the injuries that they already have, you know, then I think, you know, we all know what the answer is. You sit him, you know, for an extra week. Now, I'm not happy with a guy like, you know, Opeta at right guard. I'm just not, you know. I, when I watch him play, he doesn't look like he's, you know, overly aggressive. Most of the runs, they have to run him to Malata's side and and um, and Dickerson's side, you know, to make, to make hay. But, um, you know, Listen, it, it is what it is. Um, it's just one of those situations where this is the new NFL. Your backups better be ready to play and at any moment because injury is so prevalent. I've never seen so many injuries, so many season-ending um, injuries by some of these guys. I mean, it is absolutely ridiculous. And again, to me, it goes all the way back to the fact that they don't work hard enough. You know, you go through OTAs, you don't do a whole lot of anything. You go through training camps, you got these abbreviated practices. No one plays in the preseason anymore. You're trying to make sure you get everybody healthy to the regular season. And then what happens through the first four regular season, you know, games, you got guys who pull hamstrings, torn ACLs, sprained knees, soft tissue injuries. It just goes on and on and on and on because you just don't, you don't work the guys hard enough, you know, doing training camp. It's like, why, why isn't Jordan Davis playing more, you know, 27 plays a game, you know, is he that out of shape? Why don't you, you know, there was never a time back when I played where you got done practicing that you didn't run some kind of sprints, whether it were gassers or strider 100s or, you or know, pursuit angle, or pursuit drill, shit like that. something. I mean, these guys, they practice and then they get the hell off the field and they're done for the day. Any cardio that they get, they got to get it on their own. And if they're not disciplined to do it on their own, and most football players, listen, if they didn't make guys lift, they wouldn't lift. If they didn't make guys run, they wouldn't run. They just show up and play the game. They Listen, I would, I would venture to say that the majority of guys wouldn't even come to practice if all they had to do was show up on Sunday. Oh, absolutely. Okay? That's just human nature, okay? So the things that they need, you need to make them do it. Make them run some sprints you know, twice a week, early in the week, you know, so that they can keep their, their cardio up so that they can play, you know, an extended amount of, of an extended amount of, of downs in a game. But you see these guys, these guys, they play, you know, 50 to, to 65% of the plays. I mean, I, I, I couldn't play in this era with my mentality because I never wanted to come off the field. You, you know, and, Seth, it's funny you say that because Tony Dungy was on a couple of, Shows ago, and he said this: the reason why you're seeing a lot of injuries, in his opinion, in the second half of games, is because these guys aren't in condition. Yeah. And one of the reasons why you're seeing a lot of close scores, you're seeing a lot of games like where you know, look at the Eagles. I mean, you know, people keep saying, "How come they don't score a lot of points in the second half?" Well, I think it's got something to do with conditioning too. I mean, now you're in, you're you're a month in, Seth, so you should be. You should be there. You know what I mean? You should be able to go 65 plays without an issue right now. I can't yeah, believe I'm even saying that to you because you know what yes, I say. Yes. I'm with you. You can't play 65 plays in the first game. Of the year. Dude, you, so, you don't belong you, on the roster. <laughs> listen, but, you, but, but you know what the problem is? The problem is, you know, they don't practice hard enough or long enough to truly really get any, any real conditioning in. I mean, you think about it. If 
there's only 12 plays or 15 plays in each period. You know, the the starters don't get 10 of 15. Right. Or, you know, or eight of 12. You know, that number is more like six. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. So, so, so how much time are you actually spending on the field where you're actually running? Eight minutes. Um, and you, it's, it's just not enough. You know, I mean, I would spend, you know, the off season in the off season, man, I'm, I, I would lift and then go run. My conditioning time was damn near equal to my lifting time, you know, because I just knew, I mean, back in the day, if you can tap your head, like you're tired, if you want to, buddy would run the shit out of you <laughs> the entire next week, you know? So you knew to come in in condition and in shape and, and listen, what I want, what I always want, I, I want to play, you yeah. know, if I want to play and I want to be my best. And that means that I've got to have enough stamina that when I get to the fourth quarter, that I can do the same things in the fourth quarter that I can do in the first quarter. And if you're not conditioned, guess what? It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. I, I'm, I'm looking at one of your guys here. He's, um, um, no, he's talking crap. I ain't even going to give him. I ain't gonna give him. <laughs> hey, 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 Seth, one last thing here for you, man, with Brady. You know, you and I believe that the game, again, parody in the game, the league likes parody. I mean, they, they want everybody to be as close as possible. Point differential nowadays is three points. I totally get it. But is Brady right? It's just a bunch of shitty football being played right now. I mean, some of the game. I mean, like last night, that thing was totally unwatchable, man. I mean, look, and I'm going to sound like old man get off my lawn, but I mean, I mean, Redskins and Cowboys and Eagles and Giants and Niners and Giants and uh, Bears and Packers. I mean, those freaking games were 60 minute wars, man. I mean, I played in a division called the Black and Blue Division, the NFC Central Division. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, Seth. I mean, I, I sound like an old man right now, but I just see a lot, and I agree with Brady. It's seven-on-seven seven shitty football. Well, it is. You know, I mean, hey, listen, the game has just changed. It, it's, it's changed a lot. For the better? I don't think so. Yeah. I, I really don't think so. I mean, my I was talking to somebody about this just the other day. I said, how do you, how do you make the comparison – of the tight ends of yesterday with the tight ends of today. Like Bavaro. Because if if I was playing in today's game and I had Travis Kelsey man-to-man, -man, I'd be kicking his ass at the line of scrimmage and making him release where I wanted him to release, okay? But you get penalized for that. No, you don't, because you got five, you got five yards, okay, to take your shot, okay? And... What the reason why coordinators don't like to do it because they're scared to death that if a guy misses, that now oh, yeah. that guy's gonna that guy's gonna be wide open. Okay. So rather than get up and challenge people at the line of scrimmage, um what they do is they play off. And you gotta understand how offenses are coordinated nowadays, okay? Everything is timing, okay? Everything is timing. I don't care. Especially, especially when you're in zone coverage, okay? If you're in man and you're off and you're head up on that receiver that you're covering, he's got a two-way go, okay? And if you're not a supreme athlete, you don't stand a snowball's chance in hell of covering it, okay? When you drop in zone and all in the, on the snap of the ball, all three receivers, the tight end, in the back releases, okay, those routes are designed. So the tight end is supposed to be at seven. The, the Z is supposed to be at 15. The X is supposed to be at 12. The back is setting down at five, okay? So by the time the quarterback's back foot hits his drop, guess what happens? He's letting the ball go. He's not letting the ball go because he sees that somebody is open. He's letting the ball go because – the routes are, are are run on time. So you're trying to disrupt that. You're trying to disrupt that. Absolutely. Because let's say the tight end, let's just say that the tight end is the primary. 
right? And he's got a 10-yard stop route. So if I take my shot at him, that delays his release. So when he's supposed to be at 10, guess where he's at? He's at 8. And if mm-hmm. he's at 8 and he's the primary, the quarterback can't wait for him to get to 10. So what does the quarterback do? He goes to the next guy in the progression. So when, you, when you're challenging at the – And you increase the- your odds of that play having failure once he goes to second and third – because like you said, right, Seth? The first option is your higher percentage of completing the first down. Second lowers it because when we get that book, our game plan, first, second, and third, you know, we, we know if you're on your second progression, that's going to have a lesser chance of success than on the first progression if he does that. So you're up, your idea is this. Get up there, jam that guy, man. Put Kelsey, put a fist in his chest and put that guy out there Make those offenses nowadays go two and three. Is that right? Is that how well, you would coordinate? They, they, these these receivers get free release to go wherever they want. Yeah. There was a time in the game where, you know, we had a saying, no free access. That meant that everybody, everybody who was releasing into a pass was going to get jammed at least once. They were going to get a hand put on them at least once. And if I had a, if I had a running back in the backfield, Okay, it was coming out, and he was like, if this is the tackle, he was lined up on the outside foot of the tackle. I wasn't waiting for that guy to come out of the backfield. Okay, the tackle, I'm looking at the tackle. I'm keying him through the tackle. The minute I see the tackle kick, I'm coming to get him right now inside out. Okay, I'm going to attack the inside shoulder, and I'm going to jam him. Why am I doing that? Because if I attack the inside shoulder, I give him, I make him release outside where I want him to release, okay? And then I eat up the space. And the sooner I eat up the space, the less apt I am to give him a two-way go. But the back's in the backfield at four yards. The linebacker's lined up at five, okay? When the ball is snapped, the linebacker just goes parallel to that five-yard line line that he's on, and the back's coming out. By the time the back comes out, okay, there's – seven to eight yards worth of space in between them. And then what happens is they get head up on him and he's got a two-way go. So you got those those F under routes. And you, and you got those un, uncover routes where they come inside and they get you to thinking they're going to cross and they plant their inside foot in the ground yeah. and turn around and go back outside. Yeah. I mean, if that – Almost like a wheel to, route. I mean, when guys used to run those routes on me, I hit him in the back of the head. He was out of the damn route. <laughs> I mean, you, you, I'm going to let you – you're going to go down in there like I don't I don't see what you're trying to do? It's like the wheel route. Yeah. I mean, the, the wheel route's the same thing. Guy comes out of the backfield. The tight end comes out, and he runs – he's running parallel to the line of scrimmage, okay? What out route is in the route tree where he runs parallel to the line of scrimmage? Okay. He's running parallel to the line of scrimmage because he wants you to chase because yep. the minute he gets you on the same level that he is, he's going to turn it out he's into a right. I mean, just – just, it's just football smarts to be able to understand that. And when I see these young guys getting getting beat with that kind of nonsense, it's like, what the hell is your coach teaching you? What kind of information is he putting inside of you, okay, in order for you to win and be successful? But that's in front of a camera too, Seth. you got to have guys that, that are motivated to do that. And that leads me to Kobe Dean. Are you concerned that he's only had three reps this year? Is it – It's. I mean – He's a third round draft choice. And this kid's supposed, and I get Kaiser and TJ are playing good, but I mean, Seth, three reps. I expected hey, more out of that. And you know what? I'm not, I'm not saying he's a bust. I'm not saying anything like that. But I'm saying, shit, man. I watched that kid Lloyd play down in Jacksonville. That kid's killing it down there in Jacksonville, man. This kid can't get on the field. Hey, well, let, me, let me let me tell you something, man. I don't know. I, 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 I was I was pissed off on on draft day because the information about his pet came out on draft day, and my theory was okay. You had him at the combine, you had him at his pro day. You had the ability to come in anytime that you want to and work this guy out. Why did it have to wait till till the day before the draft or draft day to come out that he's got a pet issue? So okay, does he have a pet issue because he ain't getting on the field? Or did we overvalue him in the top 15 and he fell in the draft because everybody began to see that he didn't was he wasn't running a lightning fast 40 time. 
he just had great tape, you know, from his senior year in 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 in, in Georgia. And he's so, a little dude too, man. Hey, man. Hey, listen. T.J. Edwards is playing lights out. You I know, the last the last time time, the last time I was, the last time I was on with you, Dan, I said, you know, you know, watching Kazir White through preseason, I'm like, this dude may make the play the, the pro yeah, bowl this year. Yeah. And, and and he was you remember he was my preseason. Yeah, pick, yeah, no, I he agree. Make the pro bowl. Yeah, but after watching T.J., I mean, when they go to dime, Kazir White comes off the field. TJ stays in and plays. Dude. I mean, that's just like blows my mind. It, how much he undrafted he too, from, right, one, from one year to the next. Seth, undrafted too. That dude is old school, filled the gap. I mean, like this. Dude, garden way, centers away. He's in that gap, man. He hits that. I mean, no false steps. I mean, the thing that I'm impressed with TJ, he is a key reader. And maybe that's because he wasn't thought of a lot when he came out of college, Seth. But I'll tell you one thing. And he's got a little bit of that like you, because when you watched you on film, one of the things about that gang green defense, no, not too many dudes except for Jerome with false steps. Most of the guys read their keys because I tell people this all the time. Don't follow the ball. It'll always lead you away from the play. Follow your keys. It will always lead you to the ball. And when you do that, and you've got guys doing that, this guy, TJ Edwards, man, reminds me of an old school linebacker, Seth. I mean, he reads those keys. They go away. He's in the gap. He, he never takes a false step. I'm impressed with him. Let me, let, let, let me tell you something, Sil. I had – so I was consulting with a, a pro linebacker in the offseason. And one of the first things I asked him when we were watching film together, I said – what are you keying? What are you looking at? And you want to know what he told me? He said, um, well, they teach us to, you know, key the back. And I said, what? He was like, yeah, they teach us to key the back. And I said, you know, I'm not trying to like speak in opposition of what you're being coached to do. Okay. Because what I'm going to teach you to do is broaden your vision where you can read through the line to the back. Okay. I said, but the problem is the quarterback and the running back are the two greatest liars on the entire offensive side of the ball, okay? If I'm a quarterback and, you know, and I want to run the ball to the two, four, six, eight hole, okay, why would I reverse out to the one, three, five, seven hole? <laughs> okay, and let, me, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because these coaches who teach these guys this nonsense, OK, they're key in the quarterback. The quarterback reverses out. They take a step to the side that he reverses to thinking that that's the way the ball is going. And they create angles, blocking angles for the ball where it's really going to the two, four, six, eight hole. OK, instead of reading the offensive lineman, because they're the one group that cannot lie to you. They're the only group that cannot lie to you. If it's pass, they're setting. If it's run, they're firing off. Okay. If it's a if it's a some kind of pull play, okay, that guard is gonna be light. And I can still hear Jerome. He's light, he's light. You know, <laughs> you, you just you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, reading splits. And, reading and, splits. And what, is, and, and what does that do? That gives you an opportunity to anticipate what's happening. But what you gotta do, what I what I started teaching him to do, okay, you gotta keep through the uncovered lineman to the back, okay? Now, I'm not telling you don't look at the back, but I was trained to follow the offensive lineman. The offensive lineman never lied. Now, there's some, and I told him, there's some key breakers. I've seen teams, you know, go full pull here and turn around and hand the ball, and the ball goes Info where? With blocks. Yeah, because that, that defensive end on the backside, always he's crashing like crazy. So they game plan the fact that he's going to crash. So they run the back ball back where, you know, he's vacated. I said, but you can pick that stuff up in game planning and, and film study throughout the week. Those are key breakers to, to, to kind of confuse your eyes, you know. But the eyes are the most important part, you know, of, of, of playing football. And the great players have really, really great eye discipline. You know, they lock in on what they're supposed to be locking in. They believe what their eyes – you know, tell them like this, there's no self-doubt, and they just play balls to the wall all the time. The guys who really have a problem, and the hardest part 
you with young players, they come into the NFL, they don't have that kind of training that I'm talking about. They don't get that kind of training that I'm talking about, and they struggle. Seth, this was an education for everybody who's been going. Incredible football talk here, man. And look, that post game show is spectacular. You are spectacular. You are spectacular to me, too. And I want to thank you because, again, it's an education, too, because seeing the game through your eyes, I, I, I try to tell people this all the time. It's one thing to watch a game, but it's another thing to watch a guy like you and Singletary. And, you you know, Buddy has given you the knowledge of the game, and you can see how you see the football game. You don't you, – you see it through what's in front of you, splits, keys, all of this stuff, and – it's truly a great lesson each and every single time that you come on here, man, bro. I love you, man. I mean, it's an honor to have you on here too. And it's an honor to have you as my friend. Thank you so much, Seth. You got it, man. Anytime I'm busy, but I always make time for big sales. You got it, man. Thank you so much, Seth. I appreciate it, man. Seth Joyner. Don't forget you catch him also on the post game show, which is the best post game show around. I mean, not just in Philly, but in my opinion, in the country, hit the like button. We'll expand on everything that Seth said. Keep it here on the National Football Show.